Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is Developing a Culture of Resilience, Building Back Better, and Getting Ready for What Comes Next. Uh, so just some housekeeping um, this morning. Uh, first of all, welcome from the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce for being here. Um, if you have any questions throughout the session, uh, right down at the bottom, you have your chat function. So please add them in there. Um, we'd ask that you please mute your microphone during the presentation portion. Um, if during the question period you wanted to turn on your camera and turn on your mic and ask your question that way, that is completely fine, but please have it on mute during the presentation. Uh, and we are recording this session, so we will be sharing it on our YouTube channel. Uh, if there's any coworkers or anyone you think that would benefit from this, please share it with them. All right, so today's session, uh, the recent pandemic has impacted every part of our lives and much has been said about resilience. A comprehensive and systematic approach to resilience is now the leading edge for individuals, teams, and organizations who seek to thrive, not just survive. This webinar brings together the fields of clinical psychology, international disaster relief, and commando operations to look at how applicable actions can be put in place to build a culture of resilience. Our speaker today is Ross Preston, so I'd like to introduce Ross. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll get on with the um, sort of uh, content in a moment. I just wanted to really um, sort of set the whole scene for this. Um, Normally, we would work with teams in all kinds of areas, uh, right from sort of developing a coaching culture right through to um, to sort of individual leadership and coaching stuff. A lot of what we do, though, sits in the realms of resilience, and of course, that has just gone, you know, really big in the last uh, in the last two or three months. What I'm really talking about here, and I wanted to put this out there, was the idea of resilience being very much uh, involved with the people in your organisation. Um, whenever uh, I get involved in an organization, it's really at the people level, be it collectively or individually. Um, I've done uh, work in the past where resilience has been obviously about uh, protecting your, um, uh, your uh, organization and risk management and that sort of thing. I'm not going to be talking about that style of resilience in this. It's going to be much more around the ideas of people being resilient and being able to keep our organizations and teams working at their best uh, through their through their resilience. So that's the sort of direction we will be talking through and we're looking about really how it starts with the individual, grows the team, becomes an organizational idea um, as far as resilience is concerned. And then we start thinking about how we can create that as a culture and a way of being and a way of acting and a way of understanding each other as we go through. Um, I've spent a lot of years um, sort of developing some of these ideas of resilience. I'll talk some more in a moment about Catherine, who's, um, who's done very much to build this specific model. But um, resilience, honestly, is better learned um, when you have you know, relatively small bumps in the road. Um, right now, having to learn resilience on the fly when we're in quite a, um, a turbulent time with some really very notable challenges, um, that's uh, actually in some respects uh, more of a challenge. So the way I would recommend to do that is actually to break it down and start even smaller. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we go through the session. So uh, I'm about to share my screen. Um, as far as uh, that happens, I find it a real problem to see the chat. So if anyone sort of got some issues or would want to ask a question or whatever, what I'll do is I'll run through the, um, the, the sort of uh, theory and some of the ideas around this stuff, uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll probably stop sharing, come back, and then I'll be able to pick up the stuff on the chat. Um, but if there's anything that um, needs to be brought to my attention, I'm sure, uh, Tanya, if you could keep an eye on the chat and then, you know, just shout out and I'll, um, and I'll adjust as I go. Is that okay? That's perfect. Great. Okay, without further ado, let's do some screen sharing. Here it is. Okay, so um, very quick um, uh, catch up on uh, on what we do as an organization. Um, we, I'm just trying to make that move now. Oh, slightly worry. Sorry, my uh, share is not doing what it should do. Let's try that. Oh, that's much better. Um, 
So yes, uh, Adroit, we really specialize, as I mentioned, in the people aspect of, uh, of organizations. Um, and so whatever it is we're talking about, whether we're talking about change, which I think is a big thing we'll be looking at in the um, need for resilience in this. We don't work in the systems of change. We don't work in the processes. We work very much in the people uh, and how the processes need to serve the people and the people then need to be in the right mindset to serve the, uh, the processes. When we get into the ideas of resilience, um, Catherine and I draw on uh, very much our personal experience. Uh, Catherine, um, uh, I'm sure some of you met her, and, and if not, I hope you'll meet her in the past. She's very much the brains of the, uh, of the outfit, as you've probably spotted by now already. Um, Catherine's a clinical psychologist. Uh, she has a PhD in developmental psychology, um, and she spent a great deal of her time practicing um, working in um, acute and chronic child uh, health in Dyes Hospital uh, in London, um, and then latterly moved into working into a multidisciplinary team uh, that was uh, really driving towards pain management, and uh, that multidisciplinary team would take a particular individual suffering in those areas, and Catherine would very much take care of that, again, the person side of that through uh, psychology. So. Her approach to resilience, if you like, comes from those sort of key areas. And when I come onto the sort of resilience model, which I don't have a huge amount of time to get into depth with, these are the sort of foundations um, that, that um, simplify that idea of resilience, which I'll come onto in a moment. Uh, uh, just a quick uh, run through uh, my history. I did nearly two decades as a British commando, uh, deployed operationally all over the world, um, uh, well, seven occasions in. Uh, in various guises doing various things. Um, I uh, learn a lot about resilience um, from a bit of a practitioner point of view doing that stuff. Um, but actually, as I've come to learn and understand more about resilience, um, it goes far beyond um, just hanging on in there. Uh, and I'll explain more about that in a moment. Uh, I was wounded on my, uh, on my third tour in Afghanistan, and um, that ended my military career. I was caught in an IED blast, and um, I then left and went to an organization called Shelterbox, uh, and you're going to hear more about Shelterbox, actually. I'm going to use a Shelterbox case study to talk about the idea of cultural resilience uh, in a moment, um, but that was an organization uh, that was really very much about um, building resilience at the sort of cultural level, uh, at the community level, if you like. Uh, and then you will understand a little bit more about that. And I was director of operations there for a couple of years uh, before we moved to Canada. Uh, and we're uh, living based in uh, Fredericton now. Absolutely love it here, been here for seven years. Uh, and, uh, and what we do is this kind of stuff, but not just here. I spend um, quite a lot of time, uh, or used to spend quite a lot of time traveling around the world, uh, working with all kinds of different organizations, um, you know, very much into things that you'd expect. We've got the money for that, like financing and, and oil and gas, but also into big educational organizations as well. So, uh, and indeed not for profits. I've gone back and done quite a lot of work with Shelterbox uh, since I left that organization. So, um, so that's the sort of stuff we do. Again, very much driven towards the people side and that resilient stuff at the moment is, is really where people are trying to, uh, to get their teams. So the first idea really I want to talk about is, is what resilience is. Um, huge amount of stuff out there at the moment. We've been bombarded in our uh, social media with so much stuff around, you know, wellness and resilience and mental toughness and all of that sort of stuff. Um, resilience has been a bit of a kind of wild west, really, I would say, in what I do in organizational development, probably for six or seven years. Um, <coughs> but, excuse me. But, um, but I think now we're starting to settle in to understand you know, what resilience is, what it entails, um, and how it affects very much the people in organizations. So we can take all of these phrases, you know, like wellness, like grit, like mental toughness, um, and I think really the capture, the, 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 the phrase that really is the way that industry is working towards now is the idea of resilience. So why does resilience matter in teams and organizations? Um, well, again, it's always about, you know, being at that kind of leading edge and, and being a, as effective as any organization can. And that's where I'm passionate and that's where the people uh, get involved. So resilience matters because it maintains performance. Um, and at the bottom line of all of this actually is the bottom line. And what we need to be able to do is keep our organizations effective, um, keep them growing uh, and, uh, and help them turn out the, uh, the, the product that we need to make. 
uh, it maintains relationships. Um, people who are struggling with their resilience uh, very often find themselves uh, with mindsets and behaviors that aren't great for the collective um, benefit of an organization. And so being resilient helps us uh, in our relationships. And of course, then it helps us in our health. Um, and I'm gonna talk quite specifically about the impacts on health uh, that, you, uh, that you see um, from the ideas of stress. And then of course, it impacts on our quality of life and that too is deeply important. So with those kind of uh, factors, this is why resilience um, is really very much at the forefront, um, but very much so um, when we've had uh, you know, quite, a, um, quite a period of chaos and uncertainty thrown upon us, all of these things are the things that suffer. Uh, when that starts to happen. So what happens to organizations when these things uh, impact? Well, you get something very simple like uh, pressure turning to stress, and we're gonna very, uh, be very clear on our definitions between those two things. But once we start to get stressed, then we are unable to uh, function, um, and uh, that makes means we start to uh, break down, if you like. This can cause frustration, it can uh, put our mental health at a great deal of risk, which then of course um, becomes much more about our physical health and we start developing that, that ill health, we see that together. And one of the things I think that uh, I would also point out very much when I talk about uh, resilience is, is to try and park our sort of Western culture idea around health and medicine and this sort of stuff. Um, this idea that we have mental health and physical health as being two different things for some reason, Western culture treats those things very independently. Um, and that sort of ghost in the machine uh, kind of philosophy, the sort of Descartes idea, really doesn't function well when we're talking about um, resilience. Um, mental and physical health are inextricably tied, and I will, um, and I will absolutely uh, tell you why that is the case in, uh, in a short while. Once we get into that area though, then we start getting into absenteeism, people going off with stress leave, um, and of course, the other danger then is you also get something called presenteeism. Uh, they're showing up, but they're just not productive. And in some respects, that's even more dangerous both to them and the organization. So those two things are something that, that then of course starts to lead to an increased workload on those that remain. Then we get more pressure, then stress grows, and then we start to break down even the most resilient people in our teams. And we start to see much more team and organizational failure as a result of that. Now, um, if it sounds like I'm painting a, you know, quite a dramatic picture there, um, I, I've seen this happen. I've seen it happen on uh, military operations. I've seen it happen in societies impacted by, uh, by uh, natural and man-made disasters. You start to see a malaise um, set in and you need to be able to take positive steps forward. And one of the things that you'll notice from the title, it, it's, this isn't about just getting by. We are going to be living with dynamic, difficult, challenging change now. Uh, if we weren't living with it before, we've now got something we can focus that on, which is obviously COVID in this case. And so this isn't something we just get through. We have now got to function, live, work, and be a part of this with this in our lives. And so that's where we've got to be able to take the resilience, put these key skills in place, and be able to move our organizations forward. So a definition really, I'm gonna start the definition actually funnily enough by saying what it's not. Um, resilience is not about plowing on or keeping going when you're stressed. When I talked about my sort of uh, 18 years or so uh, as a commando, um, I feel very much that's what we did. We endured uh, and we were, you know, we had the mental strength and we had the physical robustness and we looked after each other, but that's what got us through. We were just keeping going. It's much more than that because we can only do this for a certain amount of time. And what I've seen in the past and what I've seen in this particular pandemic as well is you get to about a six week threshold where people really start to struggle. Um, and you can kind of get through to that point, but then things start to break down. So it's how do we put things in place that move people on and pass that or put them in a position where they never meet that kind of um, difficult time. So the most important thing to think about here is this isn't just keeping going on. You know, this isn't some ex commando dude telling you how to be tough, far from it. This is much more about us looking after ourselves, putting ourselves in a position to succeed so we understand what's going on uh, and we're able then to uh, adapt ourselves appropriately. 
So without further ado, um, what resilience is. Um, resilience comes down to having the mindset, the physical robustness and the support networks to enable an individual or a team to withstand pressure without becoming stressed. So it's about mindset, it's about physical robustness, it's about support networks, and it's about being able to withstand pressure without becoming stressed. And I mentioned a moment ago that I'll tell you a very clear difference between pressure and stress. We hear a lot of these words used interchangeably. And again, part of the model that we try to use is to debunk a lot of this sort of stuff that you hear going on around the idea of resilience. So a lot of sort of uh, areas will almost use pressure and stress in, 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 uh, sorry, um, interchangeably. That's not really the case. Pressure, uh, pressure outside of obviously the technical you know, area, whatever, um, pressure in this sense is something that is compelling us to do something. Often it is something compelling us to do something that we would potentially really rather not do, but it is something that we must address and is part of what we do or where we are. It cannot simply be ignored, it demands attention. That is what we would describe as a pressure. When we talk about stress, stress is the way in which we perceive that pressure. So if we perceive that pressure as a threat to us, that is when we enter stress. So stress is the physiological response that we have to a threat state, which is caused by pressure. So when I talk about a physiological response, what am I talking about? I'm talking about uh, the system that you have within your physiology to meet threats. We only have one system. Uh, as a human uh, in order to meet threats and it's the same system that kept us alive through millions and hundreds of thousands of years of evolution and it was about avoiding being killed by a predator that is what we see as a threat so what we have is a physiological response that is going to keep us alive when we are attacked by a predator that is likely to be bigger stronger and far more capable than we are so what we do is we respond with our physiological system, which comes from us dumping a huge amount of hormones into our system, which changes our physiology. And this group of hormones is called glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids, you've heard of some of them, adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, epinephrine, all of those sorts of things. These are the things that enter our system in large amounts when we are suddenly faced by a threat. So if a bear breaks cover and has decided it's going to come and eat you, uh, or that's what enters into your system. It's exactly the same response we have to an aggressive email, a buildup of stuff on our to-do list, something going wrong with our car. All of those things create that threat state in us, which create those um, hormones within us. That does us, over longer term, a great deal of harm. Our system is designed for a really short-term threat. You either get eaten or you don't. And of course, we also have um, systems that help us break down those uh, dangerous hormones. But when we live in a constant threat state, where we feel things are pushing in on us all of the time, we basically keep the alarm bell ringing, if you like. And the damage that those hormones do to us in that state is really profound. Um, it, they literally scar and damage the inside of our blood vessels. Uh, and so what you will find is uh, you are 80 times more likely to have cardiac disease where stress is, a, uh, is present. Uh, you are talking about um, heart disease, you are talking about strokes, you're talking about aneurysms, you're talking about this kind of uh, damage to our circulatory system. But then there's other damage it does to us as well. Um, we don't form good memories um, when we're in a constant threat state. Um, in the initial very short term, we drive memories very deep into our learning, but over time, the threat, the, those threat hormones actually prevent us laying down good memories. So we don't learn well when we're under stress. We certainly don't take great decisions. One of the other physiological responses we have is your brain is able to burn uh, three times more simple sugars in the presence of those uh, hormones. So you become vastly more efficient at making a lot of very, very fast decisions. 
but actually the areas of our brain that we recruit are very limited. We don't recruit our prefrontal cortex, for example, which is what we would describe as our, our, mammalian, our human brain, if you like, the one that does our higher thinking for us. Uh, and the prefrontal cortex is, you know, it's very thin. It runs over the whole of our, uh, whole of what you would see as your brain, about the size of a that, that we are using to make our human decision-making, our logical decision-making, uh, our humanization of things. But we don't use that part of our brain very much at all in, in the uh, presence of glucocorticoids. What we use much more is what some of you will describe, have heard of as the lizard brain and the mammal brain, if you like, the cat brain, it's sometimes called. What that does, it, it produces a lot of very fast decisions, but a lot of very reflex decisions. And of course, what that commonly breaks down to is the ideas around fight, flight, freeze, um, and, and those sort of immediate decisions that are going to keep us alive in the moment. When we're using those parts of our brain, however, we are not a learning organization. We're not an organization that is making strategic decisions, not being able to step back, look at the bigger picture and see how all this stuff fits together. We are simply reacting. And so that's what's happening when we are stressed. Pressure, becoming a threat state will cause that stress. So the big skill in all of this, as far as uh, resilience is concerned, is preventing that pressure, having a physiological response. And if we can understand what that pressure is, put it in the right place, react and respond to it appropriately, that's when we start to get it right. And that's when we're gonna start to, uh, to flourish in, uh, in difficult circumstances. So there's two sides to this as well. Yes, resilience is about standing strong in the face of pressure um, and being able to resist that pressure. But the other side of resilience is that absolute knowledge that even the most resilient of us are going to get knocked down sometimes. Um, we are eventually going to reach a point where pressure is going to start uh, causing stress. So the other side of resilience, firstly, pushing away that pressure and preventing stress. The other thing is recovering from that state of stress really quickly, rebounding fast, understanding what was going on, understanding where we are, understanding how we can deal with it and getting back in the game. And so those are the two elements of what it is to be resilient. Push that stress away, know that we're going to get knocked down, get ourselves back on our feet and working effectively as quickly as we can. And this is the big reveal, if you like. This is, you know, no fuss, no fanfare. Here it is. There are only three things you can do when you become stressed. You can either look at it and understand that situation and take action. You can either let it go because there's nothing you can actually do about it. Or you can go out there and seek support. And that's it. There are no other courses of action you take. You can take. You either decide to do something about it. If you can't do something about it because you don't control it, you've got to let it go. And that actually in the world we're living in at the moment, that's something that is a real skill and certainly worth developing. And if I, if I get some time, I'll give you a little bit of homework on that at the end. Uh, and the other thing we do is we go out there and we seek support from those that aren't in a position to help us out with this or know more about it or are gonna put us in a place for success. Those are the three things you can do. So now we understand what resilience is. Now we understand what the three things that we can do about it. Well, actually the real trick in resilience and what it takes to develop our resilience and grow and understand resilience is to get to those three things really fast uh, and how we can do that effectively. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go through. When we talk about what makes us as individuals resilient well the areas we can work on uh, are three areas uh, we can work on our physical robustness and i'll talk more about that in a moment we can look at our support networks which we'll have a little bit of time to look at and then we'll understand a little bit more about our mental toughness but those three elements that make up us if you like those are the things that we can positively work on to make us more resilient and we'll uh, we'll break them down uh, a little bit in a moment that's where it sits at an individual. However, when you look at a community or a team mindset, actually it still builds around those three, um, those three areas, particularly when we look at 
being uh, able to uh, have redundancy, be able to work through difficult times. Where can we rely on who has the knowledge and support networks, for example, and then some of the mindsets that are in place within an organization, which if you like creates that collective mental toughness. So that works at the individual and the organizational level because resilience is a systemic model, if you like. Uh, and we'll talk more about how that systemic model works uh, once I've told you a little bit more around these. So as an individual, let's look at this as an individual. Um, your physical robustness can be developed through good nutrition, exercise, and sleep. I'm going to pick each of those apart in a little bit more detail later in the talk. I want to get into some more um, um, specific stuff. But those are some of the things we can work on when we talk about developing our physical robustness. Our support networks, well, some of the ideas around where we go for support, uh, whether it's colleagues or family or close friends, mentors that we have that can maybe use some of their experience to help us out, coaches, if you like, to talk through situations, understand what's going on. And then those more sort of social networks that are either sort of real world or virtual world. And there's a bunch of that stuff going on at the moment as well. So those are the sorts of areas we get our support networks. And then what builds our mental toughness? First one being self-belief. Again, not enough time to get right into the idea of that sort of stuff, but self-belief is absolutely core to our resilience. The ability to take perspective, and that's a real key skill. Is this thing that's happening a pressure or is it actually a threat? Well, if you've got time to ask yourself that question, you're not being attacked by a bear. So it is probably a pressure. So these are some of the things we need to be able to uh, capture really quickly. And again, that idea of perspective around how bad is this really? In the big scheme of things, this is really annoying on an inbox at four o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. But actually, if this was you know, a Tuesday morning after I've had good sleep and there's not another bunch of stuff going on, would this really be creating this, uh, this um, reaction in me for a time? The ability to avoid worrying. Um, again, another key skill that we're doing a lot of work with teams at the moment is this ability to avoid worrying. And Catherine specializes in that stuff really deeply, very good at that stuff. Um, setting good goals, that's part of your actions, remember, when you look at those big three. Um, and then that mindset, being open, being able to look more broadly at what's going on, being able to adapt um, to what it is we need to be able to do, and then be flexible in the way that we achieve some of that stuff. Um, and again, not enough time to get right into that stuff, but as a really quick capture on the things that are very much in our control that we can deliberately look at and deliberately work on to grow our resilience, there they are right there. I want to sort of step this on a little bit because um, we also uh, were talking uh, about the idea of this at an organization and cultural level um, and that sort of mindset around resilience uh, in a team or an organization. And that's where we start talking about that systemic model, that how we grow this out. It all starts with the individual right down there, each of us using those three areas to grow our individual uh, resilience, if you like. But that, of course, impacts on the team. And this is where, you know, I learned an awful lot of stuff uh, when I was uh, a commando. Um, you know, when you're having a bad day, um, there's, don't worry because there's somebody there who's going to pick up some slack for you, try and take the pressure off you knowing full well that tomorrow when you're back out and firing on cylinders, uh, they're going to be uh, feeling a little bit down. And so you can pick up some of it for them. It's that sort of constant uh, quid pro quo that goes on within high performing teams and how those teams then feed into an organizational uh, idea. And then how that, of course, uh, impacts on your sort of clients and stakeholders. And it gives them uh, a view of your organization. And you know what? It rubs off. Courage is just as infectious as fear. Um, and so when we can try and create that mindset amongst the people we're with, uh, then, uh, then we're always going to get a positive result. So that systemic model, if you like. Now, um, I'm going to talk a little bit as a case study, um, uh, just a quick case study, uh, and it's going to be around uh, a tsunami um, that many of you will remember on Boxing Day 2004 uh, hit uh, Indonesia, particularly the province of Aceh. Um, and the Shelterbox response to that. As I mentioned before, I was, a, um, I was the director of operations for Shelterbox uh, for a couple of years. Um, and so I'm gonna use that as a little bit of a case study to show how systemic stuff works. Um, sh what Shelterbox does though, um, I'm gonna give you an example actually. Uh, I'll give you a quick intro film 
um, just so I don't have to try and explain what it is that Shelterbox does so it makes their story flow better, basically. Imagine a situation where you've lost everything, whether through earthquake or flood, tsunami or cyclone, volcano or conflict. What would you and your family need to survive? Imagine a situation where you've lost everything. Then a green box arrives, a shelter box. It started out as a very simple concept. What would you need for your family if you lost everything in a disaster? A strong, tried and tested tent for shelter. Some thermal blankets, ground sheets, hats and gloves for warmth. Mosquito nets and a water filter to protect your family from disease. Pots and pans to cook with, a toolkit to repair your home to earn your living. Basically life-saving, life-changing, very essential equipment. Shelterbox was founded in the year 2000 and came of age after the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004. We were able to get hold of an Antonov 124, which is the largest aircraft in the world. We sent 10 Arctic lorry loads up, enough aid for 2,000 families. A massive effort that catapulted us onto the world stage of humanitarian aid. Since then, over 100,000 shelter boxes have been sent to disaster victims on every continent around the world. Shelter boxes are delivered in the most effective ways possible. They're packed by teams of volunteers at Shelterbox HQ in Cornwall, England. They then travel by truck and aeroplane to the affected areas. And that's when the work really starts. Highly trained volunteers from the Shelterbox response team deliver boxes to the most vulnerable and work with communities to train them in using the equipment. Shelter boxes are delivered by boat or helicopter, tuk-tuk or donkey, whatever it takes. Okay, quick overview of what Shelterbox does. Um, it's a logistic solution, it's about 50 kilos and basically it will keep a family um, safe and secure uh, who've lost their home or have been displaced from their land. Oh, my bad. Um, so let's talk about um, the uh, Indian Ocean tsunami 2004. Many of us remember that um, Boxing Day tsunami. Um, and um, Shelterbox um, mobilized as fast as it could. We always uh, have a, a view of rapid intervention um, and to get the gear, the equipment and the people there as fast as possible. And this was no exception to that. We had people in country very quickly um, before the turn of the year. Um, and because of that sort of um, idea around a logistic solution, um, we were asked by uh, the UN that was heading up the response to go to a, an offshore island actually uh, called Similu. Uh, and Similu um, was uh, off the coast of Aceh um, and when we consider the impact that, that, that that tsunami had, it was a surge wave of about 10 meters. It was a huge impact um, and nothing had been heard from uh, Similu uh, since Boxing Day, everything had been wiped out, all power, all communications, everything. And so Shelterbox's job was to get there uh, one way or another, first is to do an assessment and secondly to um, help as much as possible. So the team, um, uh, they got past some huge logistic um, issues about moving our stuff there, uh, but in the end we're able to uh, sail there, predominantly in surf charters and, and small boats, small shipping, uh, carrying a few boxes, um, but we're trying to figure out uh, what was going on there. Now, you can imagine the resilience that was needed in that team to go and face uh, what was uh, potentially happening there was, uh, were, was massive. Uh, you'll remember Aceh province alone lost 100,000 people, um, and, and the tsunami um, claimed the lives of, they think, of about a quarter of a million people. So it was a huge impact. Um, and so they set off to Similo with no real idea as to what they were find, what they would find. What they did find, however, uh, was an extraordinary example of cultural resilience, uh, legendary um, now, um, because of that cultural approach 
to how do we meet challenges and how do we uh, meet difficult situations? And it's captured in, in this film. The island of Simelu off the west coast of Sumatra in Indonesia is a remote and peaceful place, home to 83,000 people who mostly make their living from fishing and farming. The 26th of December 2004 looked like just another normal day on Simelu. 11-year-old Anto Surianto and his friends were on the beach playing football when the island was hit by a major earthquake. The first thing they looked for was the low tide. Unlike most other people affected by the Indian Ocean tsunami, everyone on this island knows exactly what to do when a tsunami hits, thanks to their ancestors. In the local dialect, they have their own word for tsunami, Smong. Eh, si Mulu pernah terjadi eh, Semong tahun 1907. So, ia dah si siwan nenek moyang tamik kita masyarakat masa kat si Mulu. Supaya orang ngalik li non sebel, we, we asin suruh, maka dina humudung wek dulu. Sehingga pada waktu terjadi li non tanggal 26 Desember, apa lata lanjar wek dulu, sehingga si ngaman ninggal dah terlalu dulu. Nah, we. The islanders had about 30 minutes to reach the hills. When the tsunami hit, only seven people were killed. The rest of the island's 83,000 inhabitants were all saved. The neighboring mainland Aceh, over 100,000 people were killed. Though the vast majority of the people here on Simalu survived, their homes didn't. The island was strewn with the wrecks of hundreds of buildings, and many were left homeless. <laughs> Lalu mau lihat rumah-rumah orang tu, ada yang jual yang hancur, ada yang indah, ada habis hilang barang-barang. Kamu baru untung kamu masih hidup, ayah-ayah, ayah ambo, umat ambo, sama adik-adik ambo. For now, the islanders face the daunting task of rebuilding their island, knowing that another wave could come at any time. The people here are aware of the risk and understand the constant danger that faces them. Yang per, sehingga perlu tak ajarkan me keluarga-keluarga supaya sia begitu ngalinon waspada. And so, although the island was massively devastated, there was that cultural idea of what to do and how we act and what it is that we need to do in the face of danger and challenge. And so. When we talk about that cultural approach, when we talk about building back better, that's what they did in 1907 on Simulu. They built back better because they understood how we pass this message, not just in us because we've experienced it, but how we embed this in the way that we understand and behave and we treat certain situations that befall us. And this is where we are now. One of the things I think it's worth pointing out that, you know, we watch um, so much uncertainty uh, happening uh, at a societal level and in business and as a result of COVID or whatever. We are not a particularly robust society. Um, but in my time in the military and in my time with Shelterbox, I met really robust societies and communities. And they may seem less complicated, but sometimes less complicated is actually more robust. So what we need to be able to do is understand that things may not be the same as a result of this and we are going to have to um, start again in some areas but you know what as that little guy said it's okay i've still got my brothers and sisters i've still got the people around me that i care about so yes it's difficult and yes it's unpleasant but actually it's going to be okay and that's the idea around cultural resilience and i think we do have quite a good cultural approach as New Brunswickers. And I'm not sure I'd have thought that to as great a degree before all this happened. But what we need to be able to do is put that into our teams and businesses. And we need to be able to trust each other that we can come through this together. Uh, and that this that we're facing now is something we'll learn from and something we'll grow from. But it all comes back to that individual personal resilience, if you like. So when we understand more about how that all fits together, what do we do? We need to build our personal resilience to be able to be good 
and resilient at team level, organizational level, and then obviously in our communities and beyond if that's what we need to be able to do. So we go back to that idea of building our physical robustness, our support networks, and our mental toughness. And I'll just talk you through one each of these because we don't have a huge amount of time. But when we're talking, say, about, let's pick exercise and physical robustness. I'm not saying that in order to be uh, resilient and physically robust, you need to run a marathon. Far from it. Exercise is something that is very much built into us. It is innate in our systems. And when I mentioned that um, we have all of those glucocorticoids that enter our systems when we are threatened, uh, when we're about to be eaten by a predator, they help us do amazing things. You hear stories of running fast and jumping high and fighting with huge strength and this kind of stuff produced by those hormones. What those hormones are trying to do is make you do something. They are trying to make you move. And it will either be in a short-lived um, uh, fight, it will be as running uh, away from a situation, whatever it happens to be, they are impelling you to move, to do something. When we enter chronic stress, like we see in workplaces now, those same hormones need the same treatment to get rid of them. You need to do something physical. So you don't need to run a half marathon, but you do need to go for a 20 minute walk. You do need to take your lunch hour outside. You do need to burn off some of those, um, those stress hormones because that's what exercise is designed to do. It's built into our systems. And then of course we have hormones that replace them uh, that are actually uh, endorphins. And endorphins are actually those feel good hormones that, that are, are actually part of the morphine family. They give us a really good, happy feeling. And what you find when you see what kills glucocorticoids is those endorphins. They wipe them out of our system. And so when we're compelling ourselves to move and we talk about exercise as being good at, at helping our resilience, this is why it burns away and takes away those things in our systems. It's that that helps us respond and rebound quickly from a situation of stress. Uh, where pressure's got too much for us. Let's pick up a really quick one on support networks, for example. Let's talk about types of support. Um, normally, I deliver this over a couple of days, so, um, so I'm really rattling through this. But when we talk about close support, let's talk about our families and close friends. Uh, we as humans, we would have a very close network of maybe 30 people, 30 people who know us deeply and intimately. Uh, and then we would know how to behave and respond and be around maybe 120 people. That's really what we're set up for socially in the way that we, uh, we see the world. Uh, or so the research would tell you. We have massively shrunk those close support networks as, as people. Um, we might have a lot of friends of, on Facebook, but that's not the same. These aren't the go-to people. And so some of us have shrunk that down to maybe two, three, four people in our lives, uh, maybe even less than that, who we are, we are really intimately close to, who will become our support network, if you like. And when we think about the types of support we get from them, it tends to be the same. And broadly, there are kind of three. There's the sympathetic style of support, which is, oh, poor you, that must be terrible. Uh, and that makes us feel better. Um, it makes us feel part of something. It makes us feel that we're cared about. Then there's the sort of uh, empathetic uh, idea of support, where somebody's going to say, Something similar happened to me once. Uh, it was very difficult, but here's how I came through it. Here's some of the things that helped me get by and get through all this. And that's a really useful way of being supported as well. And then there's a third one, um, which is much more about taking perspective, um, which would say, well, you know, in all the terrible things that could happen, how bad is this really? So come on, princess, um, it's, time to, it's time to suck it up, buttercup, and, and get on with it. Um, and that's another style of support. And all three of those styles of support are important and all of them are valuable and have their place. If you had a big group of people, then you'd be getting that style of support or those three styles of support from different places, from different people at different times. But because we've really closed down our support networks, we tend to go to the same place and get the same response and the same reaction. And sometimes that's not always as appropriate as it might be. So again, something we can do Let's think about our support networks. Where do we go? What style of support do we need to get? Do I need to get a different and uh, varying view on how I might be uh, able to be supported when I'm finding things tough? And then let's just have a really quick 
um, look at uh, one of the mental areas of mental toughness. Uh, let's choose self-belief. Two styles of self-belief. You have your um, sort of trait confidence, uh, which is your very big, broad confidence, your view of yourself, if you like. And then you have specific confidence. Specific confidence is that you are good at something. Um, quick to build, quick to erode. Very difficult um, to hang on to that because it only takes one or two things uh, and you suddenly think you're not that good at whatever it happens to be because it's not working right now. Your trait confidence really is what you are trying to protect when we talk about our personal resilience, your view of self, your self-esteem, if you like. It takes a long time to build, takes a long time to erode. So when we're talking about resilience and having that self-belief, one of the important things in there is to keep our self-confidence high. We are all very good people. We are all very capable. We have plus and positive points that we need sometimes to remember and remind ourselves of. We need to hold on to that trade confidence because we know we can meet this challenge. And so as we build those around ideas around mental toughness, this is some of the stuff where you start seeing stuff around, you know, wellness hitting maybe all three of those areas. Well, actually that's absolutely right and valid. What I would say is understand your resilience, deliberately build things in each of those three areas because there's one thing I've seen, um, the sort of stuff we're seeing a lot on social media at the moment, it's all quite haphazard. Um, but we can be deliberate in the way that we build our resilience. And that is probably the quickest way of making ourselves uh, and our organizations and teams more resilient. Be quite deliberate about it um, and target those things. Think about it and then grow that and be aware and bring it into your consciousness and all that good stuff. So that's where we go with the core resilience model. So you know, normally that whole piece and a bunch of other stuff around it's probably a day, um, but that's a good start. Um, and I think it really helps our, our, our understanding. I just want to talk very briefly about COVID-19. I know I've only got sort of 10 minutes left, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dwell on this. Um, the reason I choose this, this uh, is from William Bridges' um, model um, around transitions uh, and change. Um, and, and how uncertain and how difficult things are uh, when we're in that sort of moment of neutrality, if you like. And, and where we are in all this, I think, is something that's really useful to understand. When we used to deploy to places as, as Shelterbox, we would be very clear in understanding um, where we thought we were in that particular disaster. What stage are we at, if you like? And we would use this five-point model threat, warning, impact, rebound, recovery. The reason why we always needed to be clear is because each of those different five areas require a different mindset, a different approach, and have different priorities around your decision-making. So we always need to be clear where we thought we were because when we went into a partner or organization uh, or we started to work with a, a, another not-for-profit, we needed to be aligned on where we thought we were uh, with this community moving through this uh, impact, because otherwise we were gonna miss. We were gonna find that we weren't going to be able to work efficiently together because we're working towards different things if we're on different places in this model. So we were always very clear in this. I found this really useful for COVID-19. Uh, threat, we're through threat. We had threat for about a century um, since the last major flu pandemic. Uh, and so whatever we did or didn't do during the threat stage, too late now. Um, warning. Warning started at around the turn of new year where we knew stuff was going on. Now, that mobilized some people to action, but not everyone because it didn't need to. But that's where the warning phase started to impact. Sorry, started to, to occur. And then we moved to impact. And we did a great job here during impact. It was outstanding, I think. We did plank that curve. We did everything we, we meant to do and we got it very right. Uh, other places, as we're seeing, really aren't doing so well with managing their impact. And many are still in it. Uh, and this is a very difficult place to start making decisions and being able to uh, take a step forward. So impact really is so dynamic. Your decision-making is very, very short-term. And if you like, you are, you know, in, in contact with the bear when you're in that impact phase. Once that passes and we move to rebound, 
Rebound, I think, is something that's really important to understand. And, and I hear so much stuff um, where I think we're misappropriating the, the word recovery. In my view, where we are in the moment is a period of rebound. We are attempting to move back towards a pre-state or a state of where we would like to be. But many, if not all, of our decisions are still being made as a result of the impact, if you like. That's what rebound is. Once we get into recovery, that's when the impact is no longer having a direct effect upon us. And so our goals, our outcomes that we're trying to achieve move away from simply the response and reaction that we are having to an impact. So what I would like to see is people using a mo lot more of the idea of rebound. Right now, um, and quite uniquely um, in many of our experiences, we are going to go between rebound and impact, rebound and impact for quite some time. And when I see quotes that say things like, we are now at this stage of our recovery, it will be much better to use language around, we are currently at this stage in a rebound, uh, and let's be hopeful that we can move on to the next one because we have no reason to find ourselves moving backwards towards impact and you know, bringing those other measures back in place. But that may well be what happens. This isn't going to be a linear line to recovery. We're going to be moving backwards and forwards. And I think one of the things that's really important in making our teams really aware of this is that this is not going to be a linear back to where we were before. Uh, and we need to accept and acknowledge that. And that very much is part of, um, of resilience. And one of the big things I didn't have time to talk about is getting people to acceptance. Once we get people there, that's when we can make the great decisions around our resilience. But I find that a really useful idea threat warning, impact rebound recovery. And we can layer that at different um, uh, stages for different people, individually, collectively, governmentally, nationally, globally. We're all in slightly different places with it, but it's a good way of breaking down what's happening to us right now. So as far as I'm concerned right now, we did a good job in the initial impact. We're now in a rebound phase, get ready for a bit more impact, keep rebounding, keep rebounding, and eventually we'll find that we can move meaningfully in towards the idea of recovery. And so what that's doing is it's making people uh, go through change. This is a model I use um, around change. This is what's going on before the need to change appears. Then suddenly uh, something else comes in that we need to do differently. So we enter a planning stage, if you like, to change. Well, we were pushed into this. Uh, we were forced into this very rapid understanding the need to do something different. Now we find ourselves thrown into this whole new idea of what are we doing differently as a result of this. And all of our businesses are doing that differently. You might have heard me talking before. I travel the world for three or four months of the year uh, prior to COVID. That's not happening now. So I am now very much in a transition period about how I deliver my business and do my work. So what we're trying to do is move away from the old way of doing things, which is the bottom line, and move to the new way of doing it and creating that new reality. Well, what happens there is we end up in this dual track. Uh, either mentally or literally, um, we find ourselves uh, either thinking that we want to be back on the bottom line, so we make decisions down there, or we're trying to run two things, what we used to do and what we now do, and the real difficulty in balancing those two things. And so a lot of the time when we're working with people in change, we're trying to understand that dual track. One of the things that we find really helps when we do this is we need to tell people what to stop doing. Very often when we ask for change, we say, okay, well now we need to do this. Very often we're very poor at saying, okay, stop doing that. Start doing this. Because we need to make it very clear that we need to value and reward the new thing we're doing and not value and rewarding, even if we would prefer to be doing it, the old thing. So this is just a, an idea around change. Now we throw COVID in there and we are forced not into two tracks, we're forced into three, four, five contingent tracks. We don't know which one to take. We have no more resources, indeed we have less resources. We don't even know what our performance indicators are effectively. And so it's very difficult to strategize in this mindset until we start making some firm decisions around some of these ideas about which track it is we're going to be uh, uh, hitting. 
And so if you like, we're putting almost another planning stage in after the transition period and then deciding which new reality we want to take. So it's a really challenging time. And one of the ways I explain that and how we bring people through that, and this is one of the last things I'll, I'll do, is the idea of what it takes to embed a change effectively. And I think it was best captured in the Lippitt model. She's a bit of a, a, a genius, actually. Um, what do you need in order to get people to be able to do things differently than they were doing them before? And one of the key things that I find coaching uh, resilience is actually about coaching change. Resilience and change are almost, um, um, uh, well, they almost always go together because it's a change that is challenging the resilience, challenging what is known, creating a threat to somebody because it's not how it used to be when it was comfortable and easy and, and you know, everything was understood. So those two things are very interchangeable. So what I would su suggest is the Lipid model is ideal for this. Um, in order to get that change successful, you need the vision. Uh, people need to have, feel that they have the skills. They need to be incentivized to do it. They need to have the resources. They need to have a clear plan about how they're gonna put it in place. And then they need to want to do it. Uh, and if you have all of those things, you have a successful change. But you can see the gaps that appear in here, which are very useful, which are very, very good, very diagnostic of what's going on in your organization at the time. And of course, we might find that we have multiple of those blocks missing at the moment. But what it does is it helps us understand where people are. If they are confused, it's because there's no vision. If it's, there's anxiety, it might be because they don't know how to do this new thing. If they don't have the incentive, well, why should they go to it? It creates that gradual change, if you like. Um, and then no resources is going to create frustration. So all of those sorts of things, we can see that happening in teams and organizations and individuals. And that's when we can start tar targeting. So what do they actually need from me as part of this as a leader or, a, or, or as part of this team uh, in order to make that change more effective. So we find that really useful. And we're using that a lot at the moment. Um, a lot of the stuff we're doing um, is in oil and gas. And as hard as COVID is, throw, throw the oil and gas situation on top of COVID and you've got a you've got a sector that's really, really in a very tough place. Okay, so. Going back, there's three things you can do. When pressure turns to stress, you can choose to act, you're gonna to need to let it go, or you're gonna to go to the right place for support. Don't forget that, those are the three big things that we can do. And just an idea around let it go, if you like. I've talked about some of the things we can do in the other areas. Here's some very quick ones on let it go. Some of us would have done a locus of control. All the things you've got going on at the moment that are pushing in on you and causing pressure, write them down inside a circle. Then look at each of those things that are causing you pressure or causing you stress right now, everything that's inside the circle, and ask yourself a simple question. Can I do anything about that? And if the answer is no, cross it out and write it on the outside of the circle. And then straight away, having done that for 10 minutes, you've got a bunch of things that you know you can just leave behind because there's nothing you can do about them. They're renting space in your head, they're producing gluco glucocorticoids, and you know what? Just because somebody else isn't social distancing or wearing a mask or behaving responsibly, there's not much you can do about it, but it's gonna cause that glucocorticoid response. So step back, you're gonna have to let that go because in the, other, in the end, it's just gonna cause you harm. Okay, questions? Thank you, thank you so yeah, much, Ross. This was, there was so much information in that presentation, but it was so great. Uh, so we've got a couple questions. Uh, we've got one from Nicole Smith. What was the name of the developer of the model? Uh, and is there more reading that can be done on those five stages? Yeah, sure. So uh, the model is um, designed by Catherine, Dr. Catherine Lavers. Um, at that email on there, or at the, um, or at that phone number, uh, and you'll be able to uh, talk that through with her and um, and develop those, some of those thoughts and ideas around that. Yes, this this whole model, this whole um, stuff is is around her being very very clever, because that's what she is. Perfect. Um, and we have a question from Roger Duval. Uh, the, what is the role of training and professional development in building resilience? Okay, so um, two different things. Training uh, in building resilience um, is really about uh, conditioning people to behave in a certain way to a certain stimulus. Um, so known input, 
known response, known output. That's that's where I would uh, put training. Um, and so lots of that actually going on in resilience. Um, it would be about how you uh, run a, a strategy um, session. It's about how you would even run a meeting. You would structure that meeting so it's very clear on the goals, what's going on right now, what's the context, what can we do about it, where are the options, so what are we going to actually do? That kind of training, if you like, in order to do the right things when faced with something um, that's a challenge or different. Uh, when we talk about development, um, then pers pe personal development is really about changing people's um, behaviors, approaches, way that they um, meet something. So, so the way that we would um, deliver resilience, if you like, as a development piece, is to get down to the individual piece and then bring the individual piece into the team and have that team understand what it is that makes that team resilient, which is done by all of its building blocks. You're only as strong as the building blocks you're building it out of, and that comes from individual resilience. But then that sort of culture of resilience, that idea around resilience as a team or an organization, well, that's when we start having really healthy conversations. So the development piece, I don't know. Um, I worked with a team recently, um, and, I, and we ended up throwing a question out there that said, um, how do you feel when somebody um, gets up from their desk uh, and disappears for their lunch hour? And everyone goes, well, that's fine. That's no problem. I don't, doesn't bother me at all. Um, but then you get into a little bit of a deeper conversation that says, well, I don't feel like I can leave my desk at lunchtime because I feel people are going to judge me for not being where I need to be. Um, you know, we're super busy. We've got too much to do. And if I'm not there every minute of the day, I think people are going to judge me. You've got to put that conversation out there and say, hey, no, you know, get out there, digest your morning at the same time as you're digesting your lunch. Um, and so it's people's attitudes and ideas that are really there when we get into development. So it's having those healthy conversations around, around you know, what's okay? What are we going to call out? Um, what, you know, are we going to stop doing to ourselves, if you like? It's those sorts of conversations around much more that development of resilience um, because it sits in people's attitudes, approaches, and, and the culture of the organization, if you like. Some of it's permissioning. Yeah, and you don't know till you get in there, really, on that one. Thank you so much, Ross. That was fantastic. Um, so thank you uh, from the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce for doing this session for our members today. Just a reminder that, that uh, it has been recorded. It will be up on YouTube by the end of the day today if anybody wants to share it. I think this is definitely worthwhile having a watch. Um, so thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day, uh, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks.